just want to make pictures, yeah. Okay. Are we there? Monique! Meow. We need you! Poo poo poo. Meow. Okay. You can still sit there. <laughs> Behind something. More and more developers. Good. Okay. So in this session, we keep everything very informal. So this rule is simply this. You have a question, I'll give you the microphone, and then one of those people will answer the question. But before we do that, I want to go very quickly past everyone that they can say uh, who they are, the name, and uh, what they did for Blender or what they are working on. Oh, uh, hi. <laughs> yeah, I'm Lucas. I've been working on Blender um, like two years ago, I think. Um, yeah. <laughs> You still do some stuff? Um, a tiny little bit, yeah. A little Sorry, bit of. Particles! <laughs> Somebody has to say it. Uh, hi, I'm Monique. I'm working on the sample based compositing. Ooh. Mm -hmm. But does anyone know what that is? No. no. <laughs> Where is it? Is it public? Finished? No, not finished. When? When is it finished? <laughs> oh boy, it's gonna take a while. In the future, definitely in the future. <laughs> Hi, I'm Mike Irwin. I work on OpenGL and uh, system compatibility. Good. And he's working now for Epic. Games. And you're working for? Uh, uh, and I work for Epic Games. Ah. I'm Bastien Montagne. I'm working on Blender development, mostly on the asset management, ID overrides, ID management in general these days. And I'm working for the Blender Foundation. <laughs> <laughs> and he fixes like half of the bugs in the bus tracker. He's, he keeps Blender stable. Yeah. Hello, Sergey Sharibin. I work for Blender. Animation Studio. And oh, wow. <laughs> and what is Blender Animation Studio doing nowadays? I don't know. I think uh, that's a question to you, but yeah. I do everything. We have no idea what they're doing. <laughs> Hi, I'm uh, Brecht van Lommel, and uh, well, I mostly work on cycles nowadays and some other parts of Blender. I'm Stefan Werner, and I'm working for Tangent Animation, uh, mostly making cycles faster, use less memory, and not crash. Yeah, I'm Pascal Schön. I'm uh, working for Adidas, and I implemented the principal shader in cycles. Uh, hi, I'm Lukas Stockner. I'm doing Cycles development stuff. I'm working for Theory Studios now. And I, yeah, some stuff that probably some people may know is the like, denoiser. And I'm also doing UDIM network rendering, stuff like that. When do we get UDIM? Uh, you can get it, it's public. Is but the patch has been submitted for review? Uh, not yet. Okay. I'll do it once I'm home. You do it when? When I'm home. I'm like, home. So that's like tomorrow. Tuesday. Hello, Tuesday. Okay. <laughs> we have to keep them sharp. Hi, I am Sibrin, and I'm currently working on Alembic. Ah, keep well, working. And, and keep working. Keep working. <laughs> Hi, I'm Joey. I work on VR stuff in Blender at the moment. Uh, probably going to do some GL stuff as well for 2.8, maybe some Falcon, but I'm not going to talk about that. Uh, hi, my name is uh, Jeroen, and to get a bit uh, Monique, I'm working on the sample-based compositor. Aha! <laughs> hi, I'm Kier, I work on the motion tracker for Blender. Ooh. Hi, my name is Sebastian, and I work on fluid simulations. Whoa! Come on, no. come on. <laughs> you have been working on Blender, you still yeah, can't. Yeah, I have been. I'm Andrea, and I've been working for uh, Blender 2.5. Uh, um, the last time where I did work, the big things. Yeah, the file and browser, the file system, file browser, Windows stuff. Little, little yeah. thing. And now I'm looking for an area that's a little bit abandoned, maybe, and come back. The sequencer. 
The Blame the Sheik was there. That's really abandoned. Nobody does it. Maybe. We'll see. We'll okay. talk. Okay. And you too. Hello, I'm Ines, and I was working on Blender a bit of time ago. Now not uh, so much anymore as I got employed somewhere else. But I hope to get a bit of free time again and go back more into the game engine, simulation, parts, yeah. interactivity. I see he's an expert now in game logic and how to design game logic. Yes. Editors. <laughs> That's what I heard. So uh, pick the brain and make sure that all the design comes out. Yeah? Now I know how difficult it is. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Okay, I think I had all the developers. You can uh, manage this show now, guys, girls. What's the first question? What do you want to know? You know everything already. <laughs> Come on. Feature requests. Everything is fine. You were first. Can I throw it? No. Logging. Um, I'd like there to be more logging, and I'm curious as to know whether it appears in anybody's um, plans. Um, in particular, I get very frustrated that um, Blender's messages from scripts just pop up this thing that say, go look at a console if you have one. Um, and I end up having to go back and restart Blender this time from the command line so I can start seeing output better. And I'd like someone to talk about logging. 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 Does anyone have an opinion about that? <laughs> <laughs> Come on, this is, it's already exist. Well, it, it, it does exist, but it could be made better, but we, we, we don't currently have uh, any resources to work on that. But it's, it, it's, it's a nice project for, for a beginner interface designer, blah, blah, blah. So but any volunteers around to implement? But what do you mean, not for rendering, but in general, right? For all the interaction you do in the software? Or you mean rendering logging? No, no, no. It's, it's like Python throwing errors and they say, hey, please check the console. But the issue is that on Windows you can toggle the console, but on Linux and on OS X you cannot toggle console unless you started Blender from the console. So it's kind of... So we, we, we can kind of hack sound again with the, with the overriding the STD out and STDR and piping them to the space uh, info thing and print errors there, but good, better interface is possible here. So I don't know, I hope someone from this audience that it's, it's not a rocket science and we can totally have help here and get someone else involved in development. Is that not something for Campbell? Is the Python department? No, no it's no. not directly Python. It's like no. some C and some no. interface. No. It's mainly a question how to present this in the interface. Okay. I think. It's on the radar now. It has been locked on video. It has been streamed, so we will keep track of it. Okay. <laughs> ah, well, uh, there were hands here. Um, what's the chances of uh, getting Natron? and Blender to share code or concepts in terms on, on the compositing side of things? Because both have benefits. The Natron developer here, maybe? There was one last year. Hmm, I don't know. We, I, don't, I know we talked to some uh, Natron devs, but June? Yeah. Uh, I need a mic. <laughs> Uh, yes, uh, we uh, we talked to the Natron de devs, and it's it's also open source, so we looked at the code, and they are uh, uh, it, they use a totally different system, uh, and based based on that, uh, it's not easy to integrate in inside Blender as being a, a co a sh sharing code. So it's 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 more on the on the on the technical level that they make, uh, and, and, and we make different decisions about how to do compositing. It's also a in, in difference between a standalone compositor versus an integrated compositor we have. So it, it's choices. But apart uh, from Mark, uh, EXR, uh, open EXR, open files, that's working? Yeah. I mean, but we can uh, make sure that Blender can export the files. 
And Motulea, that we have the same format for Motulea files. <laughs> Is that working for anyone knows? Anyone use Natron? Natron? Sure. How does it work with Blender if you save out Motulea? Can you read the Motulea? No. I shall maybe know. He used uh, Natron, that's right. But I mean, the biggest problem with Natron are two problems, of course. One is it's a clone. It's meant to be a new uh, copy, right? And that's good. It's really awesome if somebody does it. But that's what the design uh, concept is. And they should keep doing that. But that's a, a goal in itself. And the second is they uh, support the plugin as uh, open uh, VFX. What is it? Oh, no? Uh -huh. Open FX plugins, and that's a library of plugins which is allowed to be commercial and closed. And for example, the first Natron demo I had from the maker, I said, okay, let me click around. So I'm going to add a picture and I want to blur it. And then he said, oh, oops, sorry, I don't have blur yet. So you have to install a commercial blur plugin. And I applied it. And what happened? I got a, a, a watermark on top of my picture. And then if you want to get rid of the watermark, you had to pay the coder of the Blur plugin, uh, the license fee, to get your uh, Blur working. And I can understand why, but that's really not my thing, right? That's not how I like to work. So Natron is, has been evolving now better, but they still use open uh, FX plugins. And that's an, an, an infrastructure that you cannot combine with Blender, because in Blender you cannot have that kind of plugins. <laughs> I wanted to ask a question to Jeroen. You want to talk? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Jeroen, but maybe their design decisions are more correct than ours. Uh, are you a user? <laughs> uh, used to be. Uh, well, uh, depends on what you think that is better. Because uh, also the OpenFX format is 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 really in a very old format, and this uh, is also not really uh, up to speed with uh, modern hardware. Oh, okay. So, yeah. So although the compositing code might not be shared, the motion tracking code is shared. They are using the Blender code. I, I worked with them to get it integrated. So, Natron is using the same tracker. Ah, okay. What are you? Hello. Is it possible to render uh, alpha channel behind glass shader material? Can you say it again? Is it possible to render the alpha channel behind glass shaded material? Uh, I did look into that a while back. There were some requests like being able to composite re refraction on top of something. The problem is, in, theoretically, it's doable, but not really, because you have the problem if you have a refracting object in front of a background, you would want the background to be refracted. And for that, you would need a separate render pass that stores the outgoing coordinates and everything, and it's not as easy as it sounds. Like, it could possibly be added, but it would not be as useful as you might think. Uh, well, I think, I mean, uh, I, I, it's indeed true that, that you cannot then refract the background properly, but I think in a lot of cases it's okay to just ignore it and just assume it. It's basically to treat it as if it's transparent indeed. If you have a window, the refraction is very little because you have just too late, you know, even the refraction to a window is, is very little. So it's, it's, uh, it's certainly something I think we can implement. I mean, but, but is it now using some kind of fake fake alpha, or is it not at no. all? Well, I mean, you can you can kind of do it manually, right? If you uh, right now you can have a, a refraction or, or transparent, and if you if you replace your refraction with a transparent BSDF, you can manually make like a glass shader that kind of does this. Indeed, they're not. Uh, I mean, in, in Blender internal, we had alpha for glass, right? 
lots of quotes. And, uh, but it was all fake, right? It's just a fake number. You look at, okay, this is, I think, the amount of transparency, and we call that an alpha number. And then you can composite it a little bit. And cycles is way more complicated, but cycles is about light transport and stuff. So the transparency is not a value you can take away out of the picture and then composite it in another picture. Well, I mean, Simply. I, well, I mean, I know how to do it for in cycles to make the, make it work. I mean, I've implemented it in Arnold, so I mean, but how I would you do how that do then? It. How? But you have to incoming rays and stuff. You have to store that in the alpha somehow. No. Well, no. I mean, you, you just if if you hit the background, then you you make alpha, and if you had another object, you you don't put the. I mean, it's. Okay. I, I, it would never look as as if it was rendered in one pass. No, of course not, because there will be no refraction. But if it's exactly. glass, then it's it's there's not a lot of refraction anyway. Okay. I mean, so it's it's we, we can. I mean, it's on my list somewhere to implement. I don't know when, but it's on the list. <laughs> so yeah. In the bottom, right? So, well, you know, every, everyone who asks, you know, just yeah, bits, bumps okay. it a little The more higher, you talk about it, the higher it will go. So, what is on the top of your list? Uh, Are you? I don't know. I see, I see. Uh, that's, I mean, it's, it's not a public <laughs> list, you know. It's a, it's a, <laughs> <laughs> you will surprise us. Anyone from this side? I guess my question have to do with rigging. I don't know if anyone here can answer that. But if, uh, is there a way in the future to have more control over the deformations produced by bendy bones, you know? Maybe like uh, white paint the, the, the deformations to get just the result you want? Bendy bones. Bendy bones. Yeah, bendy bones, yes. Yeah, bendy bones. I mean, uh, I think animation right now is more in just the kind of area of work. So, but yes, it, it shouldn't be that hard to implement. It's always the same question. You, you need developer power to do it, so. It's, it goes to the bottom of the list, I guess. <laughs> That's on riders, yes, and, and I, th I think Joshua is totally up to look into bending bones improvements because he, he recently had quite some fixes and little improvements in there, so. Maybe Joshua is looking, uh, Joshua is currently, uh, he's from the developer from New Zealand. He's also working on a development grant from the Blender Foundation. And we will try to keep him on board for the coming period, also to work on animation features, like the bones and other things. But this is in ongoing, so I don't know what the result will be. You? No? Uh, Hi, I have a bit of a cat background. I was wondering if there is IGS, STEP, 3D, M import possibility maybe with a plugin? Dot yeah. 3DM, Rhino. Is that 3DM or not? I know only yep, yep, Rhino. You know. So yeah, I'm also using Rhino, so I know this file format because at Adidas we use this extensively. And I haven't really thought about uh, doing some importer for this, but maybe this can be done. I have to have a look into how Rhino is storing the data, how 3DM looks like, and maybe this can be done. Maybe at first as a plugin. Is it a text format 3DM? Or yeah, I think it's a text format. Huh. But I think, uh, yeah, I have to look into this because it's normally for NURBS curves and not for meshes. And yeah, they added meshes to it, but yeah, have to have a look into this. Thank you. Yes, but here covered it already. Like what I understand is Rhino is more or less like parametric services and everything which we cannot represent in Blender natively. So it's going to be some limitations anyway, and matter how much. Yeah, and NURBS is old, man. Everybody's using subdivision services now, right? Come on, what do you need NURBS for? So, no, no, no. And who needs NURPS? Can I see people who use NURPS on the link still? Wow. What? You? Oh. Yes. <laughs> or the people who use Rhino for modeling? Rhino for using it? So, so. Oh, okay. But, and there's no way you can export from Rhino to Blender. Do Rhino have uh, OBJ or something? Yes. Yeah, hmm? always co 
Converting first to meshes, yes, like, uh, but uh, then like you lose all the potentials of having NURPS. So, yeah, you can export in uh, OBJ or FBX, or whatever. But, yeah, uh, an implementation could be nice. I mean, the the NURPS code from Blender is at least 25 years old, <laughs> at least. 30, 35. <laughs> so when I was a little kid, I, was, uh, I wrote the NURBS code. And, uh, uh, I thought, well, it was very modern then in 92 and stuff, and everybody was doing NURBS, but uh, uh, nobody really picked it up. We had a couple of people who tried, but NURBS is very technical. It's mathematical surfaces and stuff. And but NURBS should also be presented in a way that you can use it as a modeler, right? It's fun. As a rhino is doing a good job to make it accessible for artists. And that's not a trivial thing, right? There's a lot of really cool tools you have for trimming and cutting and, and, and melding and blending and those kind of things. That makes NURBS editing cool. But we don't have all those things in Blender. So even with, if you could export the raw NURBS, Blender can't do anything with it because we don't have all the support. So you have to stick to uh, converting it to meshes. Or we call someone from that side of the camera to help us with improving NURBS. Yeah. So the, what we could do is the T-Spline one day. T-Spline, yes. That would be cool. Someone from that side of the camera. Yeah. So is there any T-Spline developer here, maybe? Is there anyone who knows what the T-Spline is? No. <laughs> okay, one. Well, beautiful yeah. also plugin for Rhino. Uh, it's uh, about like uh, passing uh, seamlessly through like a NURBS model to a mesh model, modeling in sub D and then bringing it back. So, yeah. Uh, the the T plan is like something halfway between mesh modeling, the subsurf, and uh, NURBS, but it has been uh, patented and locked in by an EVO corporation from the United States. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, so we don't know about that, of course, so, but the concept is not that difficult. So the whole idea of making NURBS editing more uh, accessible is something we could work on in Blender. Uh, yeah. so I don't know where I was. Am I doing unfair now? Just on the NURBS thing, there's this awesome program called Moment of Inspiration, I think it is, MOI. I think it's the guy who worked on Rhino. He made a NURBS modeler aimed at artists. It's incredible. So I suggest maybe you buy them out. <laughs> <laughs> That'll do it. That'll do it. <laughs> so I can't I can collect the money from you. <laughs> Crowdfund. Hello, my name is Serge. Uh, I have actually three questions, I'm sorry. Uh, oh, yeah? Okay, so this is how it works. Uh, okay. The most important one. The most important one. The control C is sometimes really slow. I mean, uh, it's faster for me to crash Blender and, uh, yeah, reassign the file uh, than to use control Z sometimes. So, yeah. What? <laughs> What are you using? Um, what do you mean? What are you doing to make Control Z that slow? Um, are you using like a, a pile of modifiers no. or meshes with uh, no, billions of vertices? Or no, but we use lots of maps, and terrains, and, and visualization for architecture, and every time, and Control Z is crazy slow. Hmm? Uh, yeah. This is an undo system, and basically when I undo, it's like opening the file from scratch. So what happens is all the objects need to be evaluated from scratch. What it, there was old plans to keep all those evaluated state of the objects in the undo state, and then we can save like undo much quicker. But on another hand, the question is, do you have like multi-core machine, and did you check if all the cores are 100% busy? Because if they know, then we can optimize something out. And for, <clears throat> for currently, 2.8 might change things because of collections and things. But currently, if you want to optimize your work, uh, think of using uh, group duplicators. 
and think of linking in your data from other things. But if you have like a big terrain and you don't work on it anymore, link it in because all your undoes will then skip everything you link in. So your undo then is restricted to what you have in the local scene. So you can create really complicated things and if you link it in, it is not part of the undo system anymore. And then you can keep working very fast. That's good. Good tip. Huh? Yeah, so, so my suggestion would be actually if you can come up with a scenario with instructions that actually reproduce it reliably, that then you file a bug with it. Um, that will be very helpful. So, so if, you, if you can make it slow on my machine while I'm using it, then I can fix it. That makes it a lot easier. So if you have some scene, some sequence of operations that you do, and then you say, and then you pass control C, and then it's very slow, that makes it easy for a developer to fix it. Um, since. <laughs> if there are more than four steps, include the dot blend file. Yes, that file, much more handy. Yeah, the art of bug reporting, that's what they can talk about forever. So if you talk after the meeting, you can ask them, hey, how do I make a good bug report? And they know exactly how to do it. But the key thing is always that you don't consider it to be a support thing. It's not like, I have a problem, please help me. No, you have to man, uh, uh, transform the problem into somebody else's computer. I have to make sure that the developer gets the problem. So he should be able to redo it and recreate it and then experience it and then you can, you can get it fixed. But if the problem is only on your system and you have no idea how or what, then, uh, yeah, you, you need help, right? Or you have to find out what's going on. And after you found that, then you can get back fixed in Blender. So a suggestion for this thing in particular, um, when you are clicking report a bug, it will take you to the, the, to the um, yeah, developer's website to report a bug. So that could be the first line, the instruction. I don't know if they are there could be uh, yeah they are okay a video from I've reported two, twice but I'm dying I'm doing the, the thing uh, without reading because uh, I was able to successful but uh, for okay uh, yeah the form okay so the no also a question um, I'm doing particle system with do with the linked dupli groups so uh, only the empties are showing in the particle system uh, when I'm doing uh, uh, particles with uh, linked trees, linked things, and the dupli group only see the empties. It will be in the 2.8, maybe with overrides, uh, it will be feasible to... Mm. Part particle uh, that rendering groups with the Doppler groups linked from uh, a tree library. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Only shows the empties, and if I'm appending the trees, uh, I'm fine with that. I'm using the local groups. This is for Sergei. Question, do you want to answer this? This is just a dependency. This is a dependency. Okay, create a simple dot .blend file, and I look into this, but Is it? Yeah, there is already a bug on the website, but it's kind of a dependency or a recurrency or something stuck. So it will be maybe. <laughs> well, hey, hey, after the session, you talk to him and maybe you can. Uh, but, but, but the duplicating yeah. system and particle system going to be reworked for the new dependency graph and for the new render engines and ownership model. So there's definitely something what we can look into and see what we can fix in there. And later on, the full particle system will be redone from scratch anyway. <laughs> okay, uh, so uh, do you have any plans to uh, improve the texture uh, painter in the future? So we are able, for example, to paint in the uh, separate channels, uh, uh, in the red channel, in the green channel, something like that we can do in Substance Painter or... <laughs> if you use substance, uh, then you uh, have yeah, other opinions. <laughs> <laughs> <didn't touch anything. laughs> no. Well, we had the dish look this year, but it was more on vertex painting. 
not on texture painting. Actually, it brought uh, similar code to, to texture painting to vertex painting. So. so we know that it might be improved, but we don't currently have any priority on, on those improvements because it's kind of good enough and we have much more important broken stuff in Blender to take care about. But um, it's it's also not something. It's also not rocket science, and some someone can just also science. help. What is rocket science then? I don't know. Rocket building rockets is. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Aha! I see. I see. So when are we going to make rockets at Blender community? We could. We could. Yeah, we finally do rocket science. Yes, and then we put Blender on the moon. Ah. Oh. On Mars. Hey, but seriously, uh, the, uh, I know Campbell. That's the, he worked. Campbell worked on the texture painter mostly. There's also a, uh, a developer who's making an add-on. It's Andreas Ezau. Is he? Was he on the conference? Andreas? No, I don't think. But uh, Andreas is doing fantastic. He's really good. It's a B painter, I think it's called. You know it. The, and the add-on. So he's really smart in uh, thinking about the features that are useful for an artist to have. So he's doing all the research and design, and we are in contact with him, and I connected him with Campbell already, and Campbell thinks this kind of stuff is fun. For him, it's not that much work. So when we have 2.8, a little bit more on track, uh, Campbell is also working on UI stuff and uh, workflow and that kind of topics. But as part of the whole process next year, I'm sure he will pick up uh, stuff from Andreas and make sure that the painting and blender is uh, upgraded. And not only that, I'm also looking for people to uh, really look at a better texture editing and blender in general. Right? But we have procedural textures, uh, combining them with uh, layers and nodes, and, and, and make sure that we don't have to have a plugin with substance designer, but that we don't need it, right? But that's uh, the philosophy of the Blender project. So sorry, guys, but uh, uh, we have to, uh, that, that, that kind of workflow is fantastic. And the Blender, our uh, old Blender material system was actually almost something like that, but then with a really bad interface. So we, we have to make sure that we have good real-time rendering, you have to get a good interface with good layer definitions and node systems to manipulate your procedural coordinates, and then we have a texture system in Blender. It's really not rocket science, right? So who's going to code that? <laughs> Who thinks that's interesting to code? It's a trick question. <laughs> oh. Ah, you think it's interesting, huh? So if, when you are done with Alembic, no, no, you have other stuff to do. Yeah, I know. I'm looking for people to, to work on this. And that's one of the things we can do in the 2.8 period. Yeah, thank you. Uh, it's a question about a new collection of the 2.8. Uh, um, will they be linkable, like groups? And... Uh, is it uh, it will be usable in rigging for linking rigging? Well, at, uh, I mean it's more Dali stuff currently, but he is working on um, type of collection which is actually going to replace groups. So you can make, choose a collection and decide to make it a group, a group collection, and then that would be linkable and yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's supposed to replace groups in the end, so... Wasn't it a collection links to a group? Hmm? What? I think you also need proxies. Yeah, but proxy, we nuke them. <laughs> or proxy, we, we replace with ID overrides. It's a, it's, it's a new system which will be more robust and hopefully much less hacky, so we can you know, maintain it easily and make it more powerful, more easily to extend all the two. And, uh, so yeah, we want to get rid of proxies. Hello, um, I have a question considering masking and rotoscoping. Um, I was using this uh, for masking uh, video, and my problem was that when I applied a feathering um, that the, the keyframe stored all the information, and when I altered it, the feathering was um, all over the place. Uh, so um, somehow the, the keyframe for one mask handle uh, stores all the information, 
and uh, including the feathering. And um, yeah, when you want to to alter this one uh, handle, it brings it all. Uh, I don't know. Maybe I was doing something wrong, but what I would like to have, um, and I didn't see it, is uh, an extra keyframe for the feathering. Yeah, that would be great. Um, I think keyframes are currently stored per, per, per control vertex of the, of, the, of, the, of the spline itself, and then everything else is kind of like interpolated based on the distance. But it shouldn't be popping up that much. So if you have such a case, please do a report on the side to me and... Uh, I'll try to, to to see what we can do from from, from Blender to to support it better. But at least there's one person still using your fantastic masking code. Yeah, yeah. one person in the world. Oh wow! Oh, there are two. Oh, there's there's two. Only there's two people using it. Oh, three Sebastian people using three. it. Yeah, are there more people using masking in Blender? So we have to keep making sure that it keeps working, right? All the time. Ah, it makes the render errors go away. It's really good. <laughs> So is there anyone still using Blender internal for everything? Just to ask, yeah? And are you very unhappy that we are kicking it out? Or do you even know that we are kicking it out? Yeah, I'm unhappy, yeah. Yeah, I'm unhappy. <laughs> <laughs> so we, we still, of course, it's not out yet, right? The code is still there, right? Yeah. When is it going to be actually kicked? I can kick out it tomorrow. Yeah, you can. <laughs> you can do anything you want, but will you? Okay. Challenge accepted. <laughs> <laughs> so this, the, the, this uh, around lunchtime, I was a meeting uh, upstairs about the game engine, and then people said, "Yeah, Tom, but that, you said last year that we are going to kick out the whole game engine." I said, "I didn't say that. Right? We're going to work on a, want to have a better game engine." And the same thing with Blender internal, that we improve real-time rendering. Right? What PEV is doing is showing that you can now get like better quality rendering in real time than what you can get with Blender internal. So for the game engine, we want to have a similar thing. People see now what's possible, and then you have to get a tool that allows you to make interactive content in Blender. And that's a game engine, but it should be well integrated. So we, yes, we will keep working on that. Oh yeah, but the, the, but in 2.79 you will have Blender internal forever, right? <laughs> forever and ever. So. In the first version of 2.8, I don't think the old material system is still there. Then you have to notify everything. <coughs> hey, I typically use uh, quite a lot of objects in the scene. Uh, let's say like 2000. Uh, and these objects uh, are typically uh, instanced. So let's say I have 50 or 100 uh, unique objects. Uh, each of these objects may be instanced, and even all these objects may have LODs uh, to um, <clears throat> run faster. But I still, uh, let's say, I have two or three thousand of them in a, in a scene. It may run like a, a lower FPS. Um, and I'm wondering if this um, or the the implementation of new viewport in 2.8 will bring some speed up. To, to render much more uh, objects. I'm there not sure what's exactly the problem, but... So there, there, there are multiple problems on uh, when you have multiple objects. Like the dependency graph would not be happy when you have multiple objects, but uh, it's only during construction time. Adding an object will, could also be an issue because it does some um, checks with all the other objects to, to compare the uniqueness with the name. For the drawing, we, we implemented new botched rendering, which, which uh, prepares all the instructions needed for one instance, and it just real easily instance it's all over the viewport. But that's something what Mike can explain better, how it works and limitations. Yeah, it should definitely, if they're um, like exact copies, you're just uh, instancing these objects, uh, the new draw system should handle that pretty well. Yeah, I, and getting into the different things like LODs, I'm not so sure about that. Um, but basically, if you have one object instance ten times in the scene, then it's just doing the computation, like the CPU side computation of that once, and then uh, it can draw that multiple times, and it's it'll be yeah, it should be much better than uh, 2.7. 
if Blender internal will be replaced by Eevee, will we be able to render in background? We, we, we are looking into that problem because there are some limitations of OpenGL which on Linux requires having uh, X11 session, but with, with some other stuff like EGL we can uh, avoid this or do some other tricks, but this is on, on a list to, to, to look into. It is on the list to look into. This is actually the same issue as we're currently having with the OpenGL Play Blast. There are lots of requests to, to be able to do those in the background, and it's going to be solved sooner than later. Well, even better, you could also have a little render farm with like three or four graphics cards. Um, <laughs> right? You have uh, one f second render time per frame or something. And that's work. Huh? Then you get something done. Exactly. Uh, I wanted to know about uh, weighted normals for low poly models, game models. Uh, what's the situation? Because I know there's a Google Summer of Code. Uh, I don't, I don't know if it's merged, if everything is merged, and if it, is there anything that the core developers need to do before things like uh, uh, mirror modifier not working with uh, with weighted normals, at least as, as it was as a, an add-on. Uh, is there any development going on and that does that um, summer of code uh, project is being merged completely or has problems? We need to review the patch. <laughs> I mean, the guy submitted the patch like uh, one week ago or something like that, so the, the, the developer. So just I just need to review it first and then probably get a second pair of eyes on it and it, it should go in master, hopefully like next month or something like that. Yeah, I mean, uh, globally it's okay. Probably some details to be checked, but uh, globally it's okay. And we are not going to release 2.8 soon anyway, so that's time, right? That's no. Time, so, huh? <laughs> so when are we going to release 2.8? Whenever we're ready. Ah, whenever we're ready. <laughs> Hi. Um, we're, I think, all really excited about Eevee and uh, kind of excited to try that out on the Mac side, but I think, from what I can tell, EV is still broken on the Mac side, and I was just wondering how that's going, and also wanted to say thank you for the shadow catcher. <laughs> I don't know uh, that Clément is not here. No, it, it, I mean... Clément is hiding. He's hiding, yeah. yeah. It, so. it was, I think it was broken like two days ago, and then it was fixed, um, okay. but... I mean, it might depend on specific graphics card combination, but in general, it shouldn't be broken. So if it's broken, report it. But yeah, it, it might just break once in a while whilst things are developing. We don't accept bug reports in 1.8. I'm wondering if there's any way to stream EV into a window in my application that I'm developing so that it, I just have it as a display using kind of Blender as a backing engine. I, maybe it's an OpenGL window in my app that it is sending the display to. I don't know. <laughs> Just make a bug report, I would guess, and, 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 and <laughs> at least some, <laughs> some screenshot or so. I don't know. Come it's, on. But it's hard I, mean, to I think if you, uh, for example, uh, what Nimble Collective is doing, right? they have a remote desktop client and they stream all the graphics. Oh, uh, that thing. Oh, yeah. no. No. <laughs> I mean, but uh, this kind of stuff is, is, in the, uh, is uh, a lot of development is going on, making virtual workstations and make sure that uh, all your OpenGL drawing can be streamed via the web to other clients and stuff. And that's not depending on Blender. It's just a, a, an external program that makes sure that your drawing gets streamed somehow to another application. So I don't know details about it, that. It just kind of depends how you exactly do this. Like, for example, as a, uh, the x uh, forwarding through SSH will, to will totally work for this. If you use VNC, it will also work. If you use remote desktop, then Windows forces you to use a software rasterizer, which is no longer compatible with the requirement of OpenGL we need in Blender. And this is something we cannot solve from our side because Open Blender just needs OpenGL to, to work properly. So, But there are ways around this, and they're all outside of Blender. So 
or so much we can do about this. But wasn't uh, X11 was also designed to do this? X11 is designed. You can totally forward X11 through SSH tunnel. It's it's not an issue. It's just dash X capital for the SSH command the Blender, and it, it just runs. Um, so this question is uh, specifically to Lucas, I think. Um, first of all, thank you for your work on Video Noiser. Uh, you literally saved my life like a month ago on an animation project. <laughs> so um, yesterday you had a great talk, but I think you didn't mention the um, denoiser at all for multi-frame animation denoising stuff. So what's the state on that? The state is I started working on it yesterday, and it's coming. The problem is it already was working in the Google Summer of Code branch, but the problem of the multi-frame denoising is you want to use neighboring frames, of course, but that means you also want to use the frames that are about to be rendered. And in, in Blender, the way the render pipeline works, a frame is rendered, it's composited, saved, it completely throws it away and does the next one. So there's no way to do it as part of like click animation and it just denoises everything. So what I'm working on right now is you would enable a denoising pass that will be in the pass options, you render the animation to EXR, then you press a special button that denoises the entire animation, and then you press another button that runs the compositor on top of the denoised animation. So the workflow is pretty bad, which is why I decided to just drop it for the first release, but I don't see any better way to do this. As far as I know, uh, Pixar Random Man does the same, so I guess if they couldn't come up with a better approach. <laughs> this is also a pipeline thing where the compositors have to work with because people who, do, who use the compositors want to have like a whole shot render and then have all the raw files around on a fast SSD and then they use the all the EXRs in the composite, have a preview on a whole shot, they do all your stuff, then you can do some denoising, whatever, compositing. But denoising also works better if you know what color space you yeah. have and blur and that kind of stuff. Uh, right. there, there was uh, that would actually be pretty interesting for the compositor because it would mean that you can change your compositing setup and recomposite everything without re-rendering. Yeah. So I guess it's not too complex to do. I have to look into it. But first, the denoising part should be done pretty soon, I guess. It's not rocket science, huh? Yeah. So. Hi, um, I have a question from Twitter coming in. <clears throat> so, uh, one common workflow is to have one screen for cycles rendering and one other for different draw modes. How would that work in 2.8 since the render... <laughs> they did extend uh, limit on the message by a factor of two like recently. So it might very well be not uh, 140, but the idea is you would probably use uh, two workspaces for that, or Brecht can know better ideas. Yeah, I, I think by screen he means, well, he meant like 3D viewport, yeah, one, because now not, like, not what Blender would call a screen, I suppose. Um, okay, the w it probably but, means yeah, the window. With the thing so on the is, left yeah. you have the wireframe, on the right you have yeah. the... So, so personally, I think it's very important to be able to have like one 3D view in like solid mode and another in cycles rendering mode. And so I'll make that work one way or another. That's good news, I think. Make it work according to the design. Yes, that, I, I mean, the, the, the decisions uh, are in their hands, of course, in their good hands. But I think the, the strategy more is, let's first finish everything we already know. Because uh, yesterday I also got stuck almost in the talking about how much we do for 2.8. And it's a lot. It's really big. It's very complicated. So first we have to prove that everything we already did and what we are working on is working. Uh, sign it off, get it a, a really good interface, make it really usable, and then you can move on and say, okay, so now we have all those engines and all those unchained drawing modes. How are we going to manage that more efficiently? That's what we need user, users and designers and people to give us feedback for, for those configurations. Beside it quiet. Hi. So more question about the way to interact with Blender and with that brilliant Python interface. I think this is really great because it allows on the one hand to go and look what's going on inside on the data, but also to control things. 
Now, there are two ways to do that once you're in Python. One is through just the console, the Python console, and you type things, and that works fine. But then you can also have this text window there where you can type a small script and let that thing do things. But it seems to me like that Python from the text window, once you run it and it's done, it has displayed things, you have no way to find out in the regular Python console what it just did. It seems like it's two different uh, Python worlds, so to speak. <laughs> and at times it can be annoying because you can do things you know, complicated through a script there, and then you'd like to go and hack into it, but you can't. Somehow... Yep. You have to see that the text window is one, the, the, co the Python code which is inside it. It's exactly as if you were executing a, a Python file. So it's exactly the difference when you have the, the, the basic Python uh, executor. If you are launching the interactive command line or if you are just passing it a, a Python file to execute and then it executes this Python file and then it's just quit. It's exactly the same thing. So usually you use the text editor to, to do something similar to add-ons or UI. I mean, it, you create something which will be kind of persistent inside Blender, while the Python console is more like very quick test or very quick hack to, to do the data structure, but something which is not really... Yeah, you, you, you would call the Python operator inside the text editor and not inside the Python console, usually. Yeah. Another approach you could uh, use for this is if you call the text block something.py, then in the uh, console you can say import something, and that will module will reflect whatever you have in the uh, text editor. So if you have your code in the text editor as a function, you can just call it from the console and then hack on whatever that function returns. Um, there is any plan to improve the outliner? Yes. <laughs> I mean, the outliner needs a lot of work and a lot of improvement, and the only problem is manpower to do it. But I will need to do it for asset management, for example. We ultimately will have to have some control of assets in the outliner. But I would first like to kind of rewrite it from scratch nearly, because currently his, the way he's handling its internal events, internal operations and everything is very weird, very complicated, and very non-conventional compared to the other parts of Blender. So it needs kind of to work. I'm not very fan of adding feature in current implementation. So in the dark corners of internet, I saw the, the planning from Dalai Filinto, and he had the improvement in Outliner planned in the coming weeks because we need to improve Outliner for collections anyway. So yeah. you should work with him together, but we're definitely going to improve, improve Outliner to support all the, all the uh, new features we're going to, to introduce in the point eight. Just stay tuned. Uh, hi. Um, I, so recently, like this year, uh, I'm a software engineer, so I've discovered, oh, you've got a Python API, that's great. And I started writing um, operators, but I discovered you couldn't um, add modifiers. Um, and I wondered if there was sort of a conscious design decision behind that or or, or, or anything. What? I, sorry, I didn't quite catch the so question. You, so you can write operators in Python, Yeah. but the modifiers... No, you can't. You can't do that. You can't. Yeah. Because the, the problem is that modifier is handling a huge amount of data through meshes. So, and it's like run every time you change the setting, every time you evaluate it. So it's just not possible to do it in a... Well, I uh, thought uh, Campbell was looking at an API to do mesh, mesh manipulations faster. <laughs> To have a couple of functions and then uh, have yeah. a Python script do a massive mesh stuff. No, right. no, no, not no? with Python, please. No, Python has a stupid idea of global interpreter log, which will log yeah. the full execution pipeline when you have multiple objects using, using Python modifier, then you all of a sudden fell back into single threaded evaluation of your scene. So, please, okay. no. so then, then what? 
But then, I don't know. Some, ah, she coach. Some huh? Lisp code, Erlang, Go, whatever you name it. Or open shading language. Also, that's the general point. We're actually just discussing this outside. We often get requests for C++ API, modify API, custom closures and cycles. Blender is open source, so that's important for commercial software because, for example, if you're using Maya and you want a modifier, you can either wait for them to add it or you can add it just, or you need a plugin API. But in Blender, you can just implement it right inside uh, the software, and that actually works pretty well. So. Also, what I always say, but I know uh, there's an extra reason why people want it. It's just business, right? So if you make a, a plugin, then you can sell it and uh, have, have uh, an infrastructure of a marketplace for, for, for things to do. On the other hand, we, we still will work on a modifier design to have modifier nodes, for example, a node system to, to work with modifiers, or a node system for constraints and uh, rigging and information. And at some moment, we will have to look at a way to insert Python in this, even mm. when you don't like it. No. no. I, I, I know no? the big studios no? has no? the same exact idea of forbidding Python from this. That's then, what I fully support. And at the moment, if it's added, I will give everything to someone else and do something more fun. But, <laughs> but, uh, but the, if you have a Node API, you can find a way to have uh, things pluggable or so. Somehow. Yes, but not with Python, like some, some approach closer to OSL, what is just getting uh, just in time compiled to native code. That would be the proper uh, approach. Is OSL uh, a thing you would look at for this? Uh, kind of. Maybe not one-to-one, -one, but it, ha it has better potential. Okay, now you hear this. It's on the list, but uh, so yes, we, we are making an open source project, so we, you can basically impl implement any modifier you want. But we, I think if you have modifier nodes, you can evaluate that, how much need there is for custom things. Same is for the compositor, right? You have a, a list of compositor nodes, and you think, ah, shit, I would like to have this one, or that one, or that option, or tweak something. And that's not always trivial or easy. That's something we can look at. Are you? Okay. Yeah, in, in my add-on, I use quite a lot of uh, external uh, libraries, let's say like OpenCV. And uh, I want my user to not to basically care about if they have to use or download <clears throat> these and that um, library and its dependencies. So I use the PIP, uh, that's a, an exe uh, which comes with each uh, uh, Python version, but it's not included in, in the Blender Python. Uh, would that be possible? So because right now I have to have, uh, let's say, Python 3.5 installed to use that PIP exe. Uh, and download the, the library with all dependencies and install it. Sorry, I, I missed the beginning of the question. Something about the PyPy installer executable. Yeah, so so it's it's not part of uh, Blender. I, yes. The Blender Python. So I have to I have to have uh, Python 3.5 installed to use it to install the. the yeah. Stuff. Would it be, would, would be, would be possible to have it in, in Blender? Uh, in a limited way, because on Windows, the default Python that you download from python.org is a different build than our own build Python. So any binary um, extension won't work, as far as, as far as I know. Maybe lately that changed, but... So, as, a, as I understand it, the question is if you could include pip, like P, P I P yeah, so that... Exactly. Uh, the package manager kind of thing. And I remember there was some discussion on the mailing list about this recently, and but I don't remember the conclusion. I, I don't think there's any specific reason why we couldn't include it. It's just, but bring it up on the mailing list or look 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 in the archives and, and reply. I mean, it's, it's a pretty technical Thanks. issue, but I think it's solvable. Isn't that some sort of... So uh, aside from the new outliner window that we're going to have on 2.8, are we going to have something like a schematic view, another way to see all of our scene content, but 
on a macro level. I come from Softimash, and my, my past days I used that software. And I really love this schematic view they had uh, for because you, you could keep everything so organized, uh, especially for rigging, you know. So aside from the outliner, we're going to have another editor to see our scene, every, every single thing we have on it from a macro level. So it's like oops space, which we ha had like back in the days. But I would love to have some editor where I can visualize dependency graph and all the objects and everything exactly. on whatever detail level you need, because that would help debugging a lot for, for personally for me. And I believe it's, it's, it's a good tool for riggers. And for riggers, we can have even something more fancy where we can visualize riggers, like properly align bones and visualize all the possibly dependencies, possibly dependencies, hacks, and everything. So it what, just I, what I understood also for Presto and Primo, the tools they have in the industry, they visualize it in 3D. So you see the whole character, you see all the vertices and the bones and everything, and you can have all kinds of interesting color coding or highlighting to show you conflicts and things. Yes, that's definitely what sounds like it is really interesting for us, but it's, it's somewhere in the list and it's not in the very bottom of that list. But uh, did you ever use the Blender old oops? The thing that we had a oops, we call that in the. Um, but it was a way to uh, to show all the relationships between data blocks and Blender. And that's fun if you have five or six and seven, and then suddenly you have like a thousand of them, and then it doesn't make sense, right? You see a diagram that doesn't give you any information or extra control. So that was not really the way to do it. But we can do like from the interface, we can solve this, and there are ways. We just need someone to do this, I guess. So I think at uh, last year's conference, Reality, um, I think requested from from Sergey um, like motion curves for animation and like improved um, ghosting. Um, is that still on your list, or is it like technically impossible to to manage? Because for for animation, especially like character animation, it would be great to have. There's somebody in our studio who's begging on his knees every morning and praying to the the coders and please give me the motion parts. What right? do you mean that for for character animation? I know no why we don't do it. Why don't we do it? Well, we do this, but currently with the new dependency graph, there is lots of optimization disabled just because of the of the new way they organize stuff with the, with the copy and write implemented that will come relatively for for, for free. And we can multi-thread the uh, calculation works and pass uh, almost ideally across all the all the threads. And I mean, you can understand because if, if you have a character and, and you have a little bit of a complicated character, that takes a little while to, to have every frame calculated. And for the motion parts, you actively want to have real time, complete animation calculated every frame. Right? Because especially if you edit things, you want the motion parts to update immediately. But to update the motion parts, it has to calculate the whole animation for the whole system. And that's uh, a problem in the current code. And that's something that will be much more efficient in the future. Yes, it, it, it is definitely planned. There is a huge to do in, in that area of code. How, how and what we need to do there. We just so need to, how to finish. high is that on your list, the motion parts? So it, it can be done quite simply after the copy on write is fully enabled in, in 2.10 branch, and then it's, yeah. it, it will enable lots of features and, and improvements in, in, in quite a few areas, like uh, motion pulse, dynamic paint, and a few others, which I saw around when I was uh, reworking all workarounds and everything. He talks to animators every day, so he will be reminded, and I will remind him too. Okay? You'll get it soon. Uh, are we going to have uh, a sort of a freestyle uh, real-time render, like uh, OpenGL-based? Uh, no. 50% <laughs> chance? Um, I, well, mean, well, I, I know, uh, Tamito, uh, Kajiyama. Hmm? Kajiyama. He, uh, he has been contacted for this. He's looking into it to find out how to recode it in a way that we can fit it in the new architecture. I haven't read his mails for a little while. I don't know the conclusion. But I heard there was somebody else from China suddenly coded, put, putting something online last week. Fantastic rendering of uh, lines. But 
So um, it's currently not on the. Uh, we, we, we know we want it, uh, but there's so many things to do. Uh, there is a freestyle project. Oh, sorry, there's a, 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 a grease pencil project going on. Uh, the whole idea of 2D animation or cartoon rendered animation is really hot. We know it's in the in the focus, but I don't know the answers. I mean, I think uh, it will at least keep working at the level it is now, right? I mean, you will be able to add it on a cycles render or on an EV render, you know, afterwards, and it will be, you know, it won't be real time. But the real, whether we will do real time or not, is not sure. But I think it's pretty sure that you know the current functionality will at least stay. Well, did you ever look at freestyle the code itself, how it works? Yes, I mean, but wasn't it like a really weird port of Python stuff that became C code, and then it started reusing the Blender internal in a weird way and uh, um, convoluted a well, bit? It's its own, yeah, it's its own system. It was developed outside Blender first, and so it uses a lot of non-Blender specific stuff. But yeah. Uh, but yeah, I mean, it's but you use freestyle for things uh, a bit, okay. Some lines, yeah, okay. Lines. We need but we definitely want to have a real-time freestyle in Not the viewport, of course. But we have to look at how and when, and uh, the planning is unclear. It's quite the same as both, right? <laughs> Thank you. Uh, a question about uh, Python API. Uh, when we ask for users, data.users, we get uh, a numbers. Is it possible to get a pointer also? You actually, since in one or two versions ago, you can you won't get it from users, but you can get it from, I think it's data library, and then you can request a mapping between ID and the ID it is using yeah. or whatever. I, I don't remember the detail exactly, but you can check that in the APA documentation. I think it's bpy.data.users map. That yeah, one. something. I don't remember yeah. exactly the path, but yeah, something like that. So. I don't know if it will be possible to use um, a panoramic camera in real time, like the cycle one, but in real time. I don't know if it will be possible in uh, maybe in, in the viewport, like in EV, but with a. So you can render uh, equirectangular frames to uh, in real time, kind of, but, 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 but or, that streaming, or streaming uh, real time frames to an Oculus or something. This, this is actually what the HMD branch is doing, as far as I know. Is there a Joey in the room? Yes. Yeah. 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 Oh. Give him the mic. So actually, for the VR implementation that we do with OpenHMD, uh, I actually thought about um, creating a method to render in cycles real time on our equirectangular sphere and place the uh, user uh, in the middle of it. So you'd just be able to look around as the equirectangular was wrapped around the sphere. So I guess this could be implemented in EV and stuff like that as well uh, for a real time uh, type simulation. Um, but it depends on what you want to do because I guess if you're using EV and VR or something like that, you want to see the entire scene anyway. So, okay, but uh, ideally, the, uh, what you want is that the viewport is simply working in every normal way, but displaying things like in you know, a panorama or for VR yeah. or whatever. Right? So you don't have to go to a special mode or so to be able to see VR. That's yeah. what you are targeting at. Yeah. Right. So. Um, yeah, I guess this this could be something that could be implemented in EV quite quite easily, actually. So, uh, I was not here since the beginning, so yeah, I hope nobody asked for this question. Uh, I have a question about the denoiser. Uh, this is a very uh, magical thing. You just have to click on this uh, magical uh, switch, and uh, everything is is okay. But uh, is it possible to imagine to have something less magical? I mean, uh, something. Uh, you can decouple uh, from the rendering process because, in fact, uh, you cannot easily uh, blend things between the, the original rendering and the, and the results of the denoising process. So can we have something more like a compositing effect? Um, that 
is indeed possible. The main reason why it is not a compositor node right now is on the one hand, when I do it in combination with cycles, it's easier to do GPU rendering. And the other part was that it uses a lot of temporary data. And if I do it right during the rendering, I don't need to save it, which means that we can save a lot of RAM. But there already is a way if you enable the experimental mode to actually get the internal denoising passes in the compositor. So it would technically be possible to implement it as a compositor node. Probably you wouldn't want the full algorithm that's used in cycles, but something a bit less complex and a bit easier. It is certainly as possible in the future. I would have to look into it. Okay. Thank you. I'm going to ask you directly. Oh, I've, no, 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 no. <laughs> I've noticed that when I'm emitting smoke from an object and I enable emit from texture and it puts a texture on, I can never see that texture on the object. Is that something that's possible? Seems like that would be simple, yeah? It Five should minutes. be possible, but make a bug report and... Oh, that's not a bug, that's like a feature request or something, right? I don't know, it's but it sounds like the bug, like if you use texture on... Why would you want yeah? to have texture on a smoke object? You want to see the smoke, you want to see the object. But you, you want, want to, to see what see it's the, controlled. You want to see where it's going to emit from, so you can like dial in if you're going to emit from like a cloud texture, you can dial it in before you keep simming and watching, simming, changing. Yeah, animated, right? Moving the depth. Yeah. See, Tom wants it too. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know why they didn't code it. It's really stupid. I mean, uh, really stupid. So this coder. I, I would have done it, uh, but... Uh, Hi, I'm Masili. Uh, just a question. Uh, if I want to uh, create an uber cool PBR shader, uh, which I have noticed in Unreal 4, is that possible for an EV? Is that on the list? In OpenGL. So, no, OpenGL. Doesn't matter. <laughs> Can I create an OpenGL shader in EV, yes or no? So, you mean you write your own GLSL code, uh, or or just combine some existing nodes? Because you can you can of course create a node group and and you know the way you can with cycles or whatever. But if you want to write your own GLSL code, that's going to be more complicated because the way, for example, the EV PBR built-in shader works, so it, it it relies on all kinds of uh, other algorithms running. You know, you have to generate probes and you have to you know, shadowing algorithms and all those things, and these are, these are very much tied to uh, to all other parts of the pipeline, so it's not as easy just to plug in a different PBR shader. Uh, but, so, I mean, there is the, there has been some work on an API to, to plug in GLSL shaders, custom ones, but it's in general, it's, it's really difficult uh, to make it really configurable. Okay, thank you. Hello. So I also walked in partway through, so this may have already been asked as well, uh, or it might be too general, in which case Ton can stop me. Uh, but uh, as Blender devs, you have a lot of insight into how Blender functions, and I assume some of you use Blender as well. No? Oh. I know how to know the code. Okay. Well, uh, what are the things that you really dislike about Blender right now? <laughs> So that's for everybody. Yeah. So what's the least favorite feature of Blender? Or the the most hated thing. What do you dislike about whatever? Yeah. So what do you really like? I don't know. <laughs> Wouldn't even touch it with a stick. Oh, you mean uh, code-wise, code-wise. Mm. <laughs> Nobody touches the sequencer. Oh, come on. <laughs> I think it's a very difficult question. Maybe you first have to ask them something positive. Huh? Like, what do you like best? Ah, that's fun. Anyone has something you really, really hate? Well, where do I even start? <laughs> List is so long. <laughs> 
dependency graph. Maybe cycles, dependency graph, nodes, compositor, sequencer, curves, nerves, outliner. There's one thing that's really, really good in Blender, and that is... Of course, that's motion tracker. <laughs> It's really the only part that has been developed up, up to the standard of engineering you would like to see in Blender, right? So you're going to work on upgrading other parts of Blender to that level? Good. Excellent. Anyone has a hated thing, something? <laughs> particles. Particles. Those are like particles. Blender internal, to be honest. <laughs> Blender internal, the rendering engine. Oh, I'm on it. How tomorrow, to, tomorrow it'll be nice. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's like saying that you hate your grandmother, right? <laughs> <laughs> Why? You don't do that. You, you, you say goodbye to her, right? That's it. Okay. <laughs> so, how much time to... Ah. <laughs> the variable names in the code? Oh. Yes. And also, there's a little bit of formatting, I think, that could be improved in places. Say it again. Formatting. Formatting, yeah. And variable names. <laughs> Google style, yeah. Huh? <laughs> Man meaning meaningful variable names, comments, things to papers, yada, yada, yada. And you know what developers really hate? Do they hate documentation? <laughs> All of them, except him. <laughs> documentation is the most horrible thing. So uh, if there's anything, uh, everybody here, uh, you say, ah, I would like to help out or do something. I mean, there are, yeah, there are all kinds of nice guys and uh, girls that are coding and working on Blender. And they really like it if they get help presenting their work. Uh, either if it's as a documentation, as a video, as tutorials, as little demo files or blend files showing off features. That's a tremendously uh, fun and uh, useful thing to do. So really never hesitate just connecting to a developer, looking at the work he's doing, and make mock-ups or tutorials or, or do whatever that is. It helps a lot. Questions? Further? You? Not a question, a request. <laughs> what? <laughs> I, I wanted to, uh, uh, to uh, go back to the topic that we had directly before, which is uh, the um, uh, shader pie nodes and stuff. So I understood them uh, that there would be some GLSL code that you define in the pie node and that you can simply plug in everything and stuff. No? There was one of the original plans, but it needs really careful design because Brecht mentioned that uh, you, you, there is so much you can do flexible and and. and uh, Shader itself, because engine needs to know, okay, so this is this type of closure, I need those passes for the OpenGL to work. What we can probably do is like enable some procedural structures similar to, to what OSL does with some extra limitations. No extra, no, no GLSL defined closures and stuff like this. That, that, that could come. And then the one of the other idea was that render engine itself should, should be able to provide code for it for its node so we don't need to implement cycle shaders yeah. in, in the in the generic place but the, the, those designs are kind of on hold for now and they, they're on the list they're somewhere on the mid list the <laughs> no? Thank you. me again um yeah, yeah. <laughs> this is my second item. Okay, go on. Uh, it's from the guys from our studio, the animator, the Furious animator. Uh, we use lots of camera bindings to the markers, and I really looked up on Google and everywhere, but I didn't find a normal solution. We can't import bindings between files. I mean, you mean if I, if I uh, we use the same terrain with lots of shots, lots of cameras, and we switch between them with markers. Yeah. 
and we can't import them between files, and we can't grab markers with keyframes simultaneously, which is uh, weird. And uh, yeah, so this is my second item. It is in the code. It's still called Durian Camera Hack. <laughs> Durant camera hack. If they have Durant camera hack, I'll lower the code. Don't, don't. Get microphone. Nobody hears you. Get microphone. <laughs> But I already said it now, okay. Anyway, so we wanted the, the most easy, quick, dirty hack to switch cameras in Blender. And so we thought, ah, um, the markers, the markers are available. And then we made the markers something to switch cameras. Which is actually total abuse of a feature that was never meant to do that. But then you can add features to markers unlimited, right? So that was not the purpose. But the, the feature of how do you uh, edit cameras and switch them in a scene is really important. I mean, now for grease pencils, it's the same thing. You, you switch cameras all the time. And for uh, motion graphics, for uh, storyboarding things, you want to switch cameras. <laughs> but I don't think we found a better solution than the marketing. Game logic in the viewport. Ah, in the game logic editor for camera switching. Yeah. The sequencer. It's a typical thing you do with a sequence, just trips and swips and let the camera move. Or directly keyframing the active camera property. Hmm. Directly, directly keyframing the active camera property yeah. of the scene. Well, there is no active camera property. It's a pointer. Oh. How do you keyframe pointers? You don't do that. No, you don't. no, you don't do that. <laughs> you know that. You know that. Oh, you do. <laughs> Anymore, yeah, that's one. What performance improvements of selecting in the viewport can we can we have in two point eight? Because it's still not that quick in two point eight. Well, like um, I have about a thousand objects and twenty million polygons, and it takes about five to ten seconds to to select an object in two point eight. It does. In 2.8, current version. What graphics card do you use? Sorry? What, what, gra what graphics card, what operating system, which driver do you use? Um, Windows 7, NVIDIA, Quadro, I don't know. Quadro? <laughs> yes. Quadro, Quadro what? Quadro uh, 1000? I think it's latest. I, 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 I make fun of you, but this is, of course, a serious problem. But 2.7 uh, uh, had issues with Intel or some other graphics cards with OpenCL Select. Uh, for 2.8, we are using so many new features that some selection might be slow, but it's not mm. meant to be slow. It, it is not meant to be slow, but there could be buggy drivers yeah. and stuff like this. So, so if, if, you, if can you have uh, whatever in uh, 2.8 and you find out a way to make selection very slow in an easy way, you submit it uh, or talk to the guys. You have uh, your laptop uh, with you? With the, a, but, 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 but Builder says do not report bugs about 2.8. Uh, we have enough on our desk. But you kick my ass but, if I kick his ass. Um, <laughs> so, right? But but can you try another computer and see if it's slow? And if it's slow, then it means that we probably can reproduce this and look into that. Because in all our cases, I didn't hear any developers complaining about this. So anyway, it is supposed to be super 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 fast. Always. So it's not. A, it's for, if you have a slow selection in Blender, it's a bug. And then we have to find out how to recreate it, how to redo it, and we look at it. Yep. I have to wrap it up. You still have your 20 questions, no. but you, you one? Only one left. Very last one. Okay, last one. <laughs> okay, my last question. Um, about uh, tracks, uh, I think. Uh, I try to use it, but I need to use the sequencer to upload thumbnails and stuff and shots. Uh, but will there be an option to do this with um, uh, after Effects or similar, because we don't use the sequencer. I'm sorry. Um. What, one of the things that we're thinking about is to be
be able to create a new shot directly from the web interface as well. Oh. Um, I, actually, in the last few weeks, I've been working on getting Subversion linked to the cloud so that you can click on, I want to have a Subversion uh, repository for this project that gets linked to the cloud. If you also uh, use um, Attract, it can install a hook for that so that those things are also linked. And we try to integrate these things more and more so that it, because Attract is familiar with the assets that you have, we might also want to link them to wherever they are stored in the version, which means that from the web interface, we have enough information to actually construct um, a whole scene for you. The, we blend file with those assets, that uh, environment, and then maybe even create that file for you. So once that's done, there will probably be some API calls that you can also call from whatever other software that can do HTTP calls. So, Brian, is it going to be like a tracked SDK thing similar to Blender ID? So, whatever application can reuse that, that functionality? Are there plans to have a tracked SDK? Mm, uh, it, pretty much using the same style of API as the rest of Pillar, so you should be able to use the Pillar API uh, oh, okay. SDK. Oh, okay. Okay. We have to wrap it up, so uh, thank you, Blender developers. <laughs> You, you can still have them half an afternoon here. They're here. Talk to them. Uh, try to get them to work and solve more problems. Next talk.